and that they can't hurt themselves. So I have this, the baby one, the medium and the large. So I really oh, wow. appreciate really appreciate that. And I'll have to just show you real quickly. I raised over 200 flower seedlings for my monarchs last year. And uh, the main oh, one is um, that I love the Mexican sunflowers. So I had 50 sun plants of yeah. those, <laughs> which was wonderful. Oh, wow. So I really have enjoyed this and I enjoy helping younger children to learn about it too. Thank you, Tony. Okay, you? thank you. Thank and you now Tana. Drew, go ahead, unmute yourself. It is uh, such a pleasure to uh, finally meet you, Tony. Um, you are my super mentor. Sorry, I'm, I'm breaking up here, but um, I, I can't believe your passion yeah. and compassion for uh, one of God's greatest creations. And I want to say that I'm indebted to you, Tony, for all I've learned, and uh, most namely about dealing with oleander aphids on my milkweed. Uh, I now uh, have uh, milkweed planted in multiple areas in my yard. So I go ahead and let the aphids ravage what they will, but they, they okay. can't destroy all of it. So uh, with that in mind, uh, the monarchs at Dure still have plenty to, uh, to feed on. So I, uh, I just wanna say how grateful I am for you, Tony. Thank you, dude, that's fantastic. Okay, yeah, I, um, then, Catherine. Catherine, you need to unmute. There, okay, sorry. Hi, everyone. Hi, Hi Carol. Catherine. Hi, Tony. Hi. Um, Hi. It was several years ago. I had just moved to Oceanside, California. Uh, presently, I am living in uh, a snow-covered Nebraska. So uh, it's a big difference, but I had always wanted a butterfly garden, not necessarily to raise them. I never thought I could, but just for the nectar. And I bought a milkweed plant and um, several weeks later, I noticed that it was being chewed to death and I couldn't understand why, not knowing that there were caterpillars on it. Anyway, um, I got on the internet I found Tony's website. Thank you, Tony. And my feelings are very similar to Drew's. Uh, uh, Tony's passion and compassion are simply remarkable and very inspiring. But one thing led to another. I just kept buying more milkweed and uh, then uh, started growing it from seed. And in the year and a half I was in California, I was able to release a... Uh, around 350 monarchs and last year was my first summer here in Nebraska. It is a challenge. It, I'm learning so much, uh, but I had about 90 that I was able to release and it has simply given me such joy. And I think one of the most beautiful moments I have will always have is putting a ready to release monarch in the hand of my mother. Mm -hmm. And she was simply overjoyed, amazed. And then she let it go on its way. And I lost her two months after that unexpectedly. So I'll always have that joy. And she had such a tremendous love for what I was doing and help me with it. So to all of, all of you who, who are inspiring so many of us, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> uh, Heather Groom. Hi, um, I live in coastal Georgia and um, this is my husband, he's in the military. Um, I just wanted to thank Tony so much. Every time I needed something, I would look it up, I'd Google it, and there he was on Pinterest. And then one thing led to another. I was on his website, I was emailing him, I got his book. So I'm excited to have this because it's a nice, you know, hands-on 
traditional. Um, monarchs have just been so inspiring and just um, such mindfulness. I'm a therapist and a counselor. So um, when I'm not helping people um, in person on my, in my spare time, I enjoy doing stuff like this. So um, you have anything you want to say? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, so hello, I'm Nathan. I'm Heather's husband. Uh, I also participate in uh, Heather's, I guess I, you would call it a hobby, I don't know, um, of raising monarchs. And at first I thought it was kind of weird because um, I'm this tough military guy, but then I really realized how much it brought peacefulness into my life because uh, it's kind of hard serving in the military. I don't know if anyone else has ever served, but um, it really does help a lot and it, and it brings you back down to earth and it brings you back down to just the moment rather than, you know, the bigger world. And it's a beautiful thing. And uh, I really enjoyed watching them go from uh, the first instar because I learned about that through Tony. Thank you <laughs> for teaching me to the fifth instar to, uh, to the going to the top of the netting that um, Heather bought from because Tony. Tony suggested it. <laughs> um, and then uh, watching them curl up and create a chrysalis mm -hmm. and then uh, checking on them constantly, <laughs> especially when Heather was gone, I would babysit them. <laughs> and then uh, as soon as they, as soon as they hatched, it was just a, it was an amazing experience. And uh, I, 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 since then I've fallen in love with it. We have a giant milkweed garden now. We're, we're part, what is it? The we have milk, a way station. A way station. Way station. So we have a way station. We have a little sign out, outside. So um Thank you, Tony, for what you do and, and all the advice you've given Heather and us as a team of, of helping um, to with the monarch population. It's just, it's been wonderful, so. Uh, Heather and Nathan, uh, thank you so much for sharing that. I really appreciate it. And yeah. I'm yeah. glad you guys have learned a lot. And, and yeah, and happy gardening and raising in 2021. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, and thank you. I'm going to take a few more and then we're going to change the subject just slightly. And uh, so think about if you have read uh, Tony's book, either of them or the new uh, paper copy, um, what was it that you liked about it? So think about that. We'll take a few more uh, testimonials on how Tony has changed your life. And then we'll go on to talk about his book for a moment. So next is Kylie. Hi, Tony. Hi, Kylie. Hey, Kylie. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. Um, I just wanted to say how you've made my raising monarch so much easier. When I first started out, I would put my milkweed stems in a glass and then I would take uh, saran wrap and, and tighten that around it and then I would put foil around that to try to stabilize it a little more and so every time I would change it you know the hole would get a little bigger and it would get looser and it was just a mess and so I found your site and I got the shorter test tubes and then you came out with the bigger ones and it's yeah. those so I bought the bigger ones too and I cannot tell you how much easier those made my life. Yeah. I don't use the test tube racks. Um, my daughter does. I think she got hers from you. Uh, okay. She has a little trouble with like the, the caterpillar will want a J inside of the racks. And so, so, yeah. so, so yeah, because okay. she did that, I, I decided I would get um, florist foam, the stiff kind, the really yeah. stiff, hard kind. And I yeah. put saran over that because I didn't want it to be porous. And then I cut a hole the size of the test tubes and I put those down in there. So um, it makes it so much easier to change out the milkweed stems. Uh, it's yeah. the, one thing the one thing I will tell you, Ky or Kylie, is that um, we've, uh, we've come up with a, a different rack where the pegs are shorter. So they, okay. can't, they don't hang on them anymore because I was having that problem too, I thought, oh, yeah. this is the perfect solution because I had it developed. And then all of a sudden some would start jaying on it every once in a while. Yeah. And I went, no, oh, they are outsmarted <laughs> me again. So, but I've been using the short, the short pegs for two years and I have not had okay. one try to make a chrysalis on it. So it's, yeah. It's I will let her, yeah. I will let her know that because she's had hers for two or three years, I think. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah. Well, thank you, Kylie. And I'm, yeah, I'm glad uh, I could help make your raising life easier. Yeah, you did. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, Drew. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You have a question? I mean, do you have a testimonial? Your hand is up. Oh, uh, testimonial? Oh, he was, I, I'm he was, sorry. Yeah, Drew was on before. Okay, well, uh, uh, Drew, if you have a, uh, if you don't have a question, you can put your hand down. And if you do, put it back up. And uh, I'm going to call on Deborah to Tell speak. that. <laughs> Go ahead. Hello. And Hi, if you I, like, put your video on, but you don't need to. Yeah. I, Hi, Deborah. Hi. I wanted to, Tony, say thank you, too, just like all the other ones have said. Um, back in, I'll tell you really quick, in 2019, I had planted, I called it a bluebird garden. I've loved butterflies and birds since I'm a little girl. And I'm always yeah. saying, I live in North Carolina. I'm not far from a state park mountain. I'm always seeing the butterflies. So at the end of August, beginning of September, I planted tons of different plants to attract besides the milkweed. And lo and behold, at the end of the year, and it was getting cool already, I saw a female and she laid eggs. And I didn't have your big, uh, you know, houses yet or the net mesh, I should say. So I had same thing like the other lady said, I had a fish tank. I yeah. grabbed them and all, I emailed you and all the information was wonderful. Um, all 17 uh, survived. And it was amazing. It was the most amazing experience of my life. And I was thinking what the other lady said about her mom and, and, and your passion, you know, creation is for all of us. We were created to enjoy it. And I had a question really briefly, um, 2020, not one monarch down here in Carolina where I'm at. And I, oh, my milkweed was tremendous. All the plants are tremendous and not one monarch. I don't know if you know anything or heard anything, but um, I just don't understand why. I mean, so a lot of other butterflies, I released some swallowtails. They came, a um, bunch of those this year, but in 2020, but not one monarch at all the whole entire year. Okay, that's that's actually a good question. I'm. I think I heard less less traffic on the eastern pathway this year. But um, does anyone else to live on the east coast have the same experience? Or, um, yeah, I guess. Just unmute I'm yourself not... and uh, jump in if you can contribute. <laughs> lots, of, lots of monarchs this past fall. I live in coastal Georgia, so I'm like literally on the border, Florida Georgia border, and okay. I've had tons of them this past fall. And you're on the coastal. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm in Car North Carolina, west, west part, and there's just like not. And I've asked, I live near some botanical gardens. I even have an orchid nursery and had some of the nurseries and other people I contacted, um, even a state park. And it was just such an unbelievable decline this year. Hardly many people saw them at all up this way. I don't know why. I was just curious, but thank you very much for your information, yeah. your passion and your love. Um, it's wonderful that there's others out there. Thank you. I'm in coastal North Carolina. And I, I live in Charlotte. Oh. <laughs> okay, Elizabeth, your turn. I live in Charlotte and I had plenty of them. Oh, you did? Yeah. yeah. In 2020. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm figure. jealous. I'm so jealous. I don't know what happened this year, but that, that's wonderful. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. At least they were traveling. That's great. I live in Northern Deborah, Virginia. I... Go ahead, Doug. I, ha I live in Northern Virginia. I didn't have as many this year as I did the year before. It was phenomenal the year before. But this year, I purchased four batches from, of larvae from Kansas University, and only three of them made it out of about 60 larvae. Only three survived. Wow. Stage. The rest of them, they died when they were, um, you know, real small caterpillars. I uh, had about eight that made it to the, you know, the chrysalis stage and two or three of them just fell off the cage and died. And then four of them made it to the butterfly stage, but only two I could let go because the other ones were deformed. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, and I don't want to buy them anymore from Kansas University. Where do you all get yours? I live, in, I live in Northeast Tennessee, and um, and um, I had a few super early that were laying eggs on my milkweed when it was just barely out of the ground. Wow. A few super early like that, but then the rest came much later, but, but we had a lot here in Northeast Tennessee. 
So I'm going to ask you to mute yourselves right now. And uh, Tony, uh, give us some more comments on uh, Deb's question. We'll, we'll give that one to you. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to say um, to, uh, to Deborah, um, I, I think the one thing I always say to people when they're not having luck attracting monarchs is it's always a good time to work on your garden. Um, and I found like over the years, even when um, a lot of people have even have um, like slower seasons, like the more established your garden becomes, the more um, the more likely it is that you're always going to have monarchs coming through anyway. So yeah, even like in the early the early years when we had slow years, I just would focus on the garden, and it seems like it's really paid off, especially over the last few years. So keep keep gardening and um, they will come back. Yeah, thank you. That's that's exactly what I'm doing. I mean, it was phenomenal this year with the, the plants. I mean, I have so many and so many milkweeds and so many that they love to nectar on, but it was just like I couldn't see any. But I had a lot of swallowtails this year. Yeah. I don't know why. A lot. Um, I released a mm. lot. I even have some now still in chrysalises. So I, I guess they're in diapause and we'll see what happens in the spring with yeah. them. Yeah. You know, it's weird, Deborah, is that we saw barely any swallowtails this year. So oh it's, my yeah, it's, it's strange. Like every <laughs> once in a year, like a specific species decides to go more into certain regions than others. I guess so. And that's what happened this year in 2020. I had so many. Yeah. I'm released uh, so many and I'm waiting for these. I have 18 right now. Like I said, it's chrysalises. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't become e close. So I'm waiting to see what happens in the spring. Yeah, well, I'm glad you still got the opportunity to swallowtails because those are definitely fun to raise, raise too, and take care of. Oh, they're beautiful the too, and so, so different. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Deb Young, um, did you try every troubleshooting method uh, in Tony's book and and ask for advice in the Facebook group, The Beautiful Monarch? Did you did you do I those? Did not. I did not ask for advice, no, but I did, I have his book and I use it as like a Bible um, and it, it's really a wonderful instructions and also instructions came from University of Kansas. At the end of the season, like late August or early September, I found a half a dozen eggs or caterpillars and eggs out in my garden and all of those, six of those um, I could release, but the ones I purchased from Kansas University, the, I only released two. Okay, so I would like to comment on that. First of all, um, yeah, okay. Monarch Watch needs to know that. They really, really need to know that feedback because it's their intention to send uh, the healthiest uh, livestock, uh, with the caterpillars and eggs that they can. So they need to know that. And the other is that I'm so glad you found them in your garden because that, Thank you know, you. <laughs> It's, I mean, that's the best way. Um, mm -hmm. and Tony would certainly agree with that. And, uh, you know, when you can't find them in your garden, you order them from a, a butterfly farm, which I certainly support. And uh, next year, you can um, try a different butterfly farm. I don't know how far you are from Shady Oak, but um, mm -hmm. they're very reputable. But um, there is the uh, International Butterfly Breeders Association. You can look up which is the closest to you, and you can try ordering some livestock uh, next year. And I'm going to uh, move on to people who have had um, uh, good experiences uh, with Tony's book. So, um, okay, uh, Deborah, uh, mute yourself and uh, unmute yourself and go ahead. Hi, I'm Deb Walterman. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio area. I live sort of in the country. And Tony's book and all of your resources have saved my butt more than once. I give native plant garden tours at my house. I have two acres, about an acre of native gardens of all sorts, all different microclimate gardens. And obviously when they come to my yard for the tours, they see the monarchs and they wanna know all this about the monarchs. I don't have time. When you've got like all these people in your yard. So I just keep handing out your information and I even have some tents I buy in advance and some tubes and racks that I will give to certain people who I think are intentionally really going to follow through. So thank you, thank you, thank you for making my life very much easier. Thank you, Deb. I appreciate it. I'm glad you're having some success. So if you had your hand up, uh, uh, if you have your hand up, it's because you want to say something about uh, 
uh, Tony's book. And I'm looking, so I don't see anybody else. And I am going to uh, ask a question that has been written in. Uh, mm -hmm. Tony, so many people uh, wanted to be here to, tonight and, um, and sent in questions. So here's one from uh, Sally. And she says she has mm -hmm. so many tussock moths that they devour so much of her milkweed that even when she sees a monarch laying eggs, she still cannot find them. Uh, what advice do you have for her? Um, so I always try to let there be a healthy ecosystem developing in the garden. Um, I, I, Tussock moths, they do devour a lot of milkweed. What I usually do is I'll move them sometimes over to like certain patches of milkweed that are like in a shadier corner of the garden. They can also, um, uh, Carol, what, what is it? Um, what else can they eat besides milkweed? They can also eat the, what's, uh, uh, what's it called? <laughs> the, what's the plant that everyone always confuses with milkweed? Dog bane. Dog yes, bane. thank you, Carol. Uh, dog, what I wanted to say, dog bane. Yeah, and they, they will eat that too. So if you have dog bane by chance growing in your garden and you want to save more of the milkweed for monarchs, that's a good way to let both have their food and not destroy any nature. Thank you, Tony. Yeah. Um, but I, I have, they really did tear up our milkweed. Oh, uh, Sally's here. I would have yeah. let you ask the question. I uh, <laughs> didn't realize that. Yes. Um, I, you, I don't know, you can, uh, like, I know some people probably also like take the, the eggs off at first and just dis discard them. And I guess if you don't have enough milkweed supply, that's an option too. Um, yeah. I, I just, I always try to plant different types of milkweed and spread them out around the yard. And they'll, that means there'll always be some available for monarchs. Um, but yeah, sometimes when you have smaller spaces, you have to sometimes make those tough decisions. Yeah, I have several real nice patches of milkweed, but I really had a lot of two socks this last year. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, is Mary Kay Griffin in the room? All right, I have a question from her. Okay. Do ants eat monarch eggs and how can she get rid of them? Uh, okay, so yes, some ants do eat monarch eggs and small caterpillars. Mm -hmm. Some ants are also, um, they have this weird symbiotic relationship with the aphids and they're actually milking the aphids to get um, sweet secretions out of them. Um, and I don't, know enough about like all the different species of ants but yeah there are some ants that um will um will eat eggs and small caterpillars and maybe even larger caterpillars too again um i usually try to spread uh spread milkweed out if there's an area that seems to be congested with ants um i would plant milkweed somewhere else you you could use outdoor traps if, um, if they're like just taking over everything. Um, those are the kinds of things I try to avoid doing, but I do understand that um, we have a lot of space in different places to plant things. So for some people, it's easier to go the no-kill route than, than others. But um, yeah, I would just say if you can find a place to plant milk, another place to plant milkweed away from where the ant activity is, that that might be the best option. Or you could also even do like um, raised beds or potted plants that you can move. That might be an option too. Okay, then I'm going to take another question and I want you to think about whether you have any questions at all um, uh, uh, to ask uh, Tony, either about um, any business aspect or any uh, raising aspect. Uh, you can think about that and put your hand up if you'd like to uh, speak. And right now, um, Heather is going to jump in again and the guy she's with. Go oh, ahead, okay. Heather. I was actually, I uh, had a question. Go <laughs> ahead, you. So uh, when Heather is not around and I'm babysitting the monarchs in the garden, um, I noticed that wasps were attacking quite frequently. We had a really bad wasp this past year. 
Yeah. And we lost a lot of monarchs to wasps. So I had a spatula that I would hold and I would sit by the window <laughs> that overlooked the garden. And uh, so my military in my military life, I'm a police officer. So I felt like I had to police the garden. <laughs> and uh, so um, so I'd sit there out at the window and watch it. And I would see these wasps coming. I'd run out there, put my boots on with my spatula and I'd smack the wasp. Um, but it didn't seem to be effective in saving many of the uh, monarchs caterpillar lives. So I was wondering if there's a way to um, to kind of subvert this issue that we're having here in Southeast Georgia. I have a suggestion. I did email him about about that, and you know, I believe Tony wrote back. He said, "Well, they're females, and you know, they kind of have to feed their own." And um, that um, kind of made me think differently about it. But it was. It was horrible to watch. It for me. is. I, They're yeah. being literally kidnapped <laughs> off of my garden. I'm like, oh my God, what just happened? And then I feel bad because, you know. Will I be able to make a suggestion? Sure. sure. Um, I live out in the woods too. And last year, nothing to do with monarchs. Peppermint oil, if you spray, it does not kill them at all. Because I don't believe in, you know, using, it will deter you have, like you have no idea any type of wasp in the wasps family. If you spray peppermint oil, wherever you may see them, whether it's near the garden, in the garden, peppermint flakes, peppermint oil in a, in a bottle with water mixture on your house, it deters them tremendously. I mean, it, it's it's amazing how it works. I, I'm serious. On the milkweed itself, is that... Is that no, I've never, I never sprayed it directly on the milkweed, but I've always put no. it anywhere near the garden and it keeps them away. They just don't mm -hmm. like the scent, literally. Mm -hmm. um, besides the oil, you can literally take peppermint flakes, you know, like people make teas. And if you get the flakes and you actually put it all on the ground and you can put that on the plants, it will deter them. I, I mean, I can't even, <laughs> it's amazing. I did this this past year. Um, like I said, I have an orchid nurse and I do different things for bugs and it won't kill them, but it will keep those wasps away i kid you not oh, deborah is this something that we should be having at our picnic as well <laughs> yeah i think so <laughs> i mean this, this is this is so fantastic look at i mean you know showing up today was just for that hot tip was worth it. yeah and, and it, well and it works i i have a log home too and when i've used it on my home i don't get any nests at all on the house at all um, like I said, the flakes in the garden on the plants, it keeps them away. It is unbelievable. It, it really, it really is a great way to deter them and not kill them at all. Well, well thank you. And, and Stephen has had his hand up for a while. So go ahead, hmm. Stephen. Well, I have a, a little different experience, similar to others. Uh, first time I planted in 2015, after I recognized the 97% decline from what, uh, you know, the go outside. 10 years or something. He wants to go uh, outside. I and I planted milkweed. I had 16, 20 caterpillars and all the leaves and they all disappeared. So I just assumed they went away and made a chrysalis. The next year I had my plants out and I found several caterpillars lying on the ground. And then I saw a wasp actually on it, killing it. Mm -hmm. And that changed my whole uh, focus. And uh, talking to Tony, I bought several sizes of uh, cages and I marked off a four by six spot in my yard put in a uh, fence post or those metal things and cover it with mosquito netting. And I switched to potted plants. So all my milkweed was in potted plants. It sat outside in the yard where the monarchs can come and lay eggs. And as soon as I see them, I pick up the potted plant, which has the plant in it, and take it under the netting. And that's where they matured, climbed up on the netting. And at one time I had 33 <laughs> chrysalises stringing around the top of the netting. And I've oh, done thank that. You. Since uh, thank you, Stephen. That's a, a really um, a cool tip for those who want to leave your monarchs outside is the is the sleeve, the rearing sleeve. Yeah. Tony, well, have you tried that before? Um, I have not tried that before. I I because we have ours on a three season porch most of the time. I, I don't like having them in the extreme weather, but right. if you if you don't want to bring them and raise them, I think that's probably a, a great idea to do. I haven't tried it before, but I know other people have had a lot of success. <laughs> Okay, but understand I'm in Texas and in the summer and fall, it's not, there's not a, a temperature problem. Okay, thank you, Steve. So anybody who's not speaking, remember to uh, mute yourself again. And I'm going to call on uh, Steve Parr for the next question or comment. Okay, um, I'm going back to um, when 
Tony was talking about the male, the male um, monarch. And my question is about male monarch behavior. My observation is they seem to protect their patch. I, I have a couple um, butterfly gardens in the green space and it'll sort of do a fly around and, and even fly at birds that yeah. kind of swoop in. And I thought that's pretty cool. It's almost like they're saving it for themselves. <laughs> Yeah, I I see that type of behavior, that aggressive male behavior, all the time. They um, they chase other males around. Um, I we literally have males sometimes um, flying around our house in circles for like hours on end, and then they'll they'll go and they'll nectar right next to each other like they're friends or something for a little bit, and then all of a sudden they're back up doing the same thing again. I've seen a monarch chase a hummingbird before, mm -hmm. um, ch chase a bird before. Um, yeah, they just, they're fearless. And um, sometimes it seems a little more aggressive than other times, and then other times it seems almost like they're playing. But yeah, that's normal behavior. And um, most people that ever see uh, multiple monarchs in their yards will see that type of behavior at some point. Well, and I guess now that you mention it, I've seen where the monarchs, they do the little fly together. It's almost like choreography. Yeah, synchronized just, flying, yeah. It is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it is, it is. I don't know how they don't hit each other all the time, but yeah, it's that's an amazing thing to see. And like for those of you who have a more established garden, that's uh, quite a sight to behold. And they'll stay in there for hours doing that. And I, I guess one more observation, if I can go. I usually talk way too long, so Carol can. Oh no, go ahead, Steve. Shut me off whenever she wants. Um, year over year, we, you know, I'm 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 actually in southwestern Ontario. I'm in Chatham, the same as uh, Mary Lou. I'm in South Chatham, so it's warmer here. It's minus three degrees Celsius, whatever that is in Fahrenheit, like 26 Fahrenheit. Anyways, the same, the fourth generation come, you know, we get the fourth generation every year, right? It, removed from the previous year. The behaviors are the same, which is amazing. Like year over year, the, mon the monarchs do the same thing. And it's remarkable that those carry on in subsequent generations. Like the ones we see in May and June and July, they're four years, four generations removed from the previous May and June and July and September. And it's just remarkable that they do the same behaviors. It's after observation, it's predictable. Yeah. Well, thank you, Steve, for that uh, observation. I would like to take two more questions from people who've had their hands up for a while. I'm gonna take two more questions, then I'm going to ask a question. And then I'll tell you what's going to happen after that. So, uh, Barb, uh, go ahead. Hi, Tony. Thank you all so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. And I do, you have been such an inspiration to me and just your website and your emails that you return back. So my question to you all is, um, or to you is, I'm trying to plant more milkweed and from seed. I'm here, I'm in Southern Indiana. So um, I have this whole, five gallon bucket full of, of, of seed pods. I've been doing this for about three or four years now. And so I, whenever I try to just plant them like out there now, like the seeds outside now, they, um, they'll never grow from seed. So last mm -hmm. year I did a, a ton of like trays and started them from seed. And that was successful because I had to cold stratify them because it's the common milkweed. So I did cold stratify, but I don't think I have the space in my refrigerator to cold stratify hundreds of seed. I mean, I already started like hundred, a hundred plants. So not all of them survive, but I've got several different little gardens that I'm trying. So what my main thing is I want to be part of like the flyaway for monarch migration to build that sort of seed way, you know, like to have nectar and milkweed. So I was looking for someone to be able to like donate that, like I heard that Illinois has like um, a monarch flyway to where they have seeds and they have like a pathway for nutrition for milkweed along the way. Do you, are you familiar with anything like that, that I could have this resource of seeds to share? Um, I know that Monarch, I think Monarch Watch has uh, like a donation program where you can donate seeds to um, yeah. save, save our monarchs, I believe might have something like that too. Um, Carol, do you have any ideas on this? I don't know offhand. I think 
I have yeah. listed a couple of uh, these what things. What state are you in? Yeah, Indiana. You're in Indiana. Oh, they're doing so much good work. As a, um, they are doing so much seeding that they probably do need seeds. Uh, you may be able to Google and find it, or somebody can unmute and jump in. But yeah. uh, Mary Lou has a really good idea of how to distribute monarch seeds. Mary Lou, would you like to jump in oh. and uh, share that with us? Yeah, sure. Um, last year, I had a bump up of swamp milkweed all across the front of my garden. And it was just teeming with all kinds of butterflies, not only monarchs. Yeah. And I was just astounded. So I thought, I got to do something with this. So in the fall, um, late October and November, I did harvest the seeds when they popped open. I did not keep them in their pods. Right away, um, I opened them up and put them into a big brown uh, bag. And um, actually all I had to do was shake the bag outside and the fluff that was remaining, because I, I know how to grab a hold of the end of the pod so that you just get seeds and then you're just left with the, the wad of, yeah. yeah. So anyway, yeah. I have 11 of, of this swamp milkweed seed. No, no um, floss on it at all. Right. And I posted a picture of my garden on my personal um, Facebook page and uh, explained the situation. And I've had people sending me a self-addressed stamped, stamped envelope. And I give them a tablespoon of seeds. And there was 340 seeds in that tablespoon. Yeah. So um, I'm right in the middle of it. I've got a bunch ready to mail um, tomorrow. Um, and I've often, but unfortunately I can't um, mail them across the border, it's not legal. Mm -hmm. So um, anybody in the future, that's a great way to do it. Um, and my posting got shared a few times uh, in other Facebook pages. So I have complete strangers coming and I'm more than welcome to do it. I'm happy to do it and share. So that's how I did it. So I this think, is how you're going to populate your whole neighborhood is by blasting out that you've got <laughs> seeds. You'll even get to meet some wonderful monarch people and you'll get to send some uh, too. So our last question is with- Oh, Carol, uh, hold on yeah, for one go second. Go ahead, Tony. I just, I just wanna say um, for um, uh, piggybacking on Mary Lou's idea, there are, there are also groups, um, Facebook groups where there's like seed exchanges or things like that too, where you can also ask people and get, I don't, I don't know offhand the names of them. I'm sure there's probably some people in here that are in those groups, but I think that's a great place too, to find people that want seeds to plant and a good way to, to give a good way to get out those excess seeds to make so they're, to make sure that they're planted so they can support future monarchs. Yeah. Thank okay, you. then first of all, I would like to welcome all the new people who are coming into the meeting. And uh, I'm sure that there have been time uh, zone uh, yeah. misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. uh, the confirmation email said Toronto time, but it wasn't very specific that it was Eastern Standard Time. So next time I will try to override what that says uh, so that everybody knows that it's Eastern Standard Time. But there'll still be some, some time for the people who've just jumped in to have some fun. Uh, June, did, did, uh, did June just ask her question? No. Oh, June, go ahead. I, I wanna thank Tony for his books. I've read them and as a result created the Monarch Way Station that you see in the background. Uh, Last year we tagged and released 30 Monarchs and, um, but this year we only tagged one and the Monarchs were two months late. So I'm in Phoenix, actually Sun City, Arizona. And our Monarchs, some of them do stay here year round. Um, and we're finding, we had 20 caterpillars um, and we only got four chrysalis. And even when we put them in one of your, um, tall, um, not cages, I, I can't think of the term, yeah. um, but I bought them from you, Tony. Um, that we put two in with a large tropical milkweed and only one came out. Okay. So they must be eating each other. Um, so yeah, I don't, so you're saying like one just was in the cage and it just disappeared? 
Yes, we had two okay. with a large milkweed plant in one of your cages and only okay. and one disappeared. And they were the same size because I know that the big ones will eat the little ones. Yeah, that I was gonna say with a full milkweed plant in there and just two caterpillars, it sounds it sounds unlikely like something else had happened, but it's yeah, I can't, I can't I say much to that one. Like this. If you've ever had a large caterpillar disappear into thin air. <laughs> <laughs> They're little escape artists, aren't they, Tony? Yeah, yeah they can be for sure. Yep. <laughs> okay, Thank you. I, I get the last question because I'm running it. Um, and after I ask the last question, I'm going to close the meeting. And when I close the meeting, this gives you a chance to leave. Uh, however, we will also have a post meeting. I don't know whether Tony has time to stay or not, but he's already been very generous with his time. And in the post meeting, we'll chat amongst ourselves about anything that we want. But for now, I would like to inspire some young people who have a passion. And whether you, it's your children or your grandchildren or your neighbors, Tony has managed to turn his passion uh, into a living. And that's something, this is what we want for all the young people. You know, if you really like it, can you make any money from it so that you can uh, wake up every morning and never go to work again because you love what you do? And Tony mm -hmm. has achieved this. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you made a sustainable business from Monarchs and how you built your, uh, your, your mailing list? Okay, uh, <laughs> this was kind of the long journey. Um, so um, back in like the mid 2000s or, or late 2000s, I came across um, a, um, a company called SightSell. And basically they kind of help you to turn your passion into um, a living. And um, they tell you like, if you, if you don't, can't think of anything that you're super passionate about as an adult, go back to something that you were really passionate about when you were a child. And for me, um, that was Monarchs. And so I, that's when I started the site and getting into getting into Monarchs. But then um, I think a lot of what has helped me is building a mailing list because I've pulled people and gotten ideas from people to help serve the community better. Um, if you don't know what people want, you, it's hard to build a business. So you have to kind of reach out to people and figure out like, what do people want that they're not getting right now? And when you can figure those things out and, and kind of you know, make solutions to help people um, get the results that they're looking for, it's a, it's a good way to, to make a business, even out of, even out of monarchs. So, and be passionate about what you're doing. And like you said, wake up excited every day to, to go to work and um, yeah, and just greet life excited. Well, Do you have any other specific questions, Carol, about the... Uh, no, I, I, I want to thank you so much for coming. Uh, I want to tell everyone about, because it, it, it's really been fun. I've been so excited about this for so long and to see you and, mm. and, and to learn about uh, how many passionate followers you have. Uh, Tony's uh, mailing list is so loyal to him that uh, when he sent out an email that he was doing this, uh, 500 people replied. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't have 500 people now because I was so sure that the Zoom would crash <laughs> that I didn't send yeah. out a reminder email. Yeah. And people kind of expect reminder e emails. Yeah, As sure. a result, we've had this wonderful intimate experience where we've been allowed to leave our videos on. So it all works out. But yeah, sure. uh, you're not going to want to miss or be too late to register for any of the upcoming Zooms. And one of them is with uh, Ba Ray, who is with us today. And she wrote this fantastic book called Milkweed Monarchs and More. I never go a week without uh, looking, uh, referring to it in the summer. And uh, that's Ba Ray. And you can register for, uh, for her meeting coming up. And uh, Brenda Dietzik, who wrote Raising Butterflies uh, in the Garden, you can register for that, or Lynn Rosenblatt, who wrote Monarch Magic and so many other books and songs and things that you're not going to believe. Now, the link to join those upcoming meetings is in your chat bar. So you're going to want to look in your chat bar and get the link, 
and register for whatever upcoming meetings you want. And the other thing is that when 250 people um, signed up for Tony's meeting uh, within the first few hours, I went into a little bit of a panic because I only have room for 100. So the way Zoom works is you can register as many as you want, but then when it comes time to get into the room, only 100 could get in. Well, that would make 150 really angry and upset people. Um, so I upgraded my Zoom account, which I was very happy to do. When I started doing these Zooms, I bought a business account for $200, which I was very happy to do because if you wanna have a party, there's work and there's money and I was very happy to do it. And I'm also very happy to upgrade uh, today so that more than hundred people could get in. However, going forward, it is getting a little bit. So if you would like to contribute to offset any of my Zoom costs. It's very voluntary. I won't even know whether you're doing it. If you'd like to contribute a buck or two, just look into the chat box. Um, and Audrey is going to be posting a link where you can contribute a buck or two towards the Zoom costs if you feel that this is worthwhile. Um, Audrey, are you doing that? I've done it. So if you look at this, <laughs> I was just about to say, it's so hard to get good help. <laughs> it says me to everyone. Do you see that? Me to everyone. And there's this HTTPS and there's this really long website. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Click it. Tell me where you get, where you go when you click it. Does that work? It, yeah, it works. It goes to a PayPal site, Audrey. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. And you don't have to have PayPal. Uh, to do it. And again, it's strictly voluntary. And um, I think that's all the business. Now, I always have a few people looking after me to make sure I haven't left anything out. So if you think that I've left out something very critical, uh, uh, jump in with that now. Um, Carol, <laughs> <laughs> I have something to say. No, I just, I wanted to share like just a couple things, um, uh, talking points that I kind of, um, brought up things I just wanted to share with people. Yeah, um, good. I wanted to say, so like we've been talking a lot about raising butterflies because that's, you know, you wrote a book about it. I wrote a book about it. Um, I wanted to say that kind of my philosophy on this is I think you can make the biggest difference for monarchs if you can first create a butterfly garden and then raise a few monarchs on the side. Like I think you're going to make the, the biggest difference doing that. But a, a big mistake that a lot of people make when raising monarchs is they let the monarchs decide how many that they're going to raise and they bring in like 100 or 200 eggs at a time and they just get overwhelmed by the process. Um, mm -hmm. You all have a lot more success doing this if you if you set limits, raising limits and then stick to them, which I know can be tough because I've been really bad about that in the past too, but I've basically eliminated all the disease issues from my life with monarchs by sticking to limits. And, and then just realizing that the other monarchs that are outside, a lot of them don't survive, but that's how a healthy ecosystem works. There's, there's monarchs and then there's predators as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to say for those of you who are thinking about buying seeds and plants for 2021, um, I shared this a little bit before, always um, find out the, botanical scientific name of the plant when you're doing it because um, so many people one of the biggest complaints I get is people looking for plants and they they buy milkweed or they buy liatris or they just buy one thing and they don't realize there's a bunch of different species of that plant and a lot of times if you want to have a plant that's going to attract a lot of monarchs you have to have a specific type of plant so um, yeah, so when you're getting your seeds and plants for this year, just make sure that um, you do your research and get the best plant to attract monarchs if that's what you're looking for. Um, and, and for those, well, I think a lot of you have probably already raised, but I was just going to say, um, again, if you're just starting raising monarchs, um, raising just five five to 10, um, even less at a time just to get started is a really good way to make sure that 
you can enjoy the process while promoting like healthy raising methods and raising healthy monarchs. Cause um, I think one of the biggest problems now, or like, I think some of you may have read that, um, you know, there's problems with overcrowding and, and diseased monarchs. And it's an easy thing to prevent if you set raising limits for yourself. And I think um, you will have a much better experience and you will have a lot healthy monarchs doing that. So um, I guess those are the last points I wanted to make. And um, thank you everyone for showing up. I really appreciate this. And Carol, thank you for putting this together for all of us and the other authors. Thank you both. Yeah. And thank you, thank you, thank you, Tony. This has been so much fun and it's, it's, I just love every minute of it. So I'm going to now uh, let everybody who wants to leave, leave. And uh, the rest of us can, um, can stay and chat a little longer. Of course, you can leave at any time in these things. I'm, I should have said that at the beginning. Nobody <laughs> notices when you leave and when you don't. Yeah. So now we have a, a free for all. Oh, and somebody's just joining. Um, we have a free for all where anybody can talk to anybody else and we see how much chaos uh, uh, ensues. Can I say something really? for Tony? Oh yeah, go ahead, Barbara. Hello. Thank you. I just want to put in a plug. I love your, um, the habitats that you've created to okay. bring them indoors. The butterflies, when they come out, are able to hang on to them so well and the caterpillars go up so well. And I also love your large tubes and oh. your shorter pegs. Yeah. They, I they have the larger them. ones, which the chrysalis did form, and I got yeah. the smaller ones. And it is so easy just to <clears throat> pull out my milkweed that needs changing without pulling everything out and disturbing all the caterpillars. And I just want to highly recommend all of this to everybody. It's been great and I wanna thank you for making it so much easier. And they all seem to be staying so much healthier as well. Thank you, Barbara, I appreciate that. I have a question, I have a question. Huh? Um, uh, CAS Smith, go ahead. <laughs> yes. yes, I'm surprised nobody has said anything about aphids. I have such a problem with aphids doing in my milkweed. Um, what, what can I do? So, yeah, we talked about it a little bit before. So I think 10 years ago was the last year that I had, we had a serious issue with aphids and we didn't know what to do and just kind of let them take over like a certain part of the garden. And what happened in the years after that is we started attracting more of the predators, the aphid predators, and now it's like there's a healthy ecosystem in there of aphids and their predators, and we don't ever get milkweed that is overcome with aphids anymore. It's been, um, it's a bit incredible. It's, um, I, the other thing I tell people too is plant different varieties of milkweed and maybe spread them around a little bit. Um, I know a lot of people don't want aphids on their milkweed, so they go out and they try to kill everything with alcohol or, or whatever else, but I think all you're doing then is you're not attracting any of their predators and it's just a cycle where you have to keep killing aphids over and over. And um, I think there's a better way of doing it of kind of letting the natural ecosystem develop and um, sooner or later you'll attract more of their predators. What predators other than ladybugs? I bought um, ladybugs lace, last year. Lace wings, um, ladybugs, lace wings, those are the two main ones that I can think of. Carol, do you know what are the aphid predators over there? The predatory wasp. Oh, yeah, yeah. One, the, all the ones that, that the parasitic one thing ones. That I'm doing, one thing that I'm doing is at the end of the season when they're co completely infested, I am cutting okay. down the plant and getting rid of it. Because I do that yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they overwinter in the soil. So as soon as we're finished with the milkweed, get rid of it so that they you won't have as many next year. Yep. Problem uh, last year is that I had more um, caterpillars and the um, aphids had just killed off most of my milkweed. Right, mm -hmm. at the end of the season, it's really important to uh, store some healthy milkweed. So you've got to cut off your leaves, wrap them in, um, a damp paper towel, put them in the fridge where, where they will last for two weeks. And if you don't think that's enough, then uh, freeze some. It's not uh, ideal, 
but it, it really, mm -hmm. um, especially keeping in uh, the, the last healthy ones in the fridge, saves you in a pinch at the end of the season. I didn't know you could freeze it. Um, I, I was going to say, Carol, I think, so I've heard this before, and maybe someone else can um, tell me whether this is right or not. If you freeze them and then you unthaw them, it actually kind of, they kind of dissolve. So I, I think that freezing them isn't a good way to do it, um, but refrigerator is fine. Another um, now this suggestion. is a question that we can pass along to Edith because Edith, Edith is the one who freezes them. I haven't tried it, but um, you know, try it and uh, see so that we'll uh, know for next year at this time yeah. when we do it. So or we, always good to experiment. That's how you learn. Yeah, sure. or ask Edith yeah. how she uh, does. Let you friends know before I leave uh, about peppermint again this year like I said I live I have woods surrounding me everywhere and the first year second year I had a pretty good amount of aphids and I planted a bunch of peppermint plants on the ground mixed among all the milkweed and this past that, and this past year I'm not exaggerating hardly any aphids on the plants um, they don't it, like mint mint is it is it, a, is it a specific type of mint that you're planting, Deborah? Um, I just use regular peppermint. Regular peppermint. Okay. Regular peppermint. Um, I bought a tons of them. Um, I use it for my orchid nursery too and deterring bugs, but th they just do not like mint. A lot of different bugs do not like mint. So that's what I did. I put four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe in certain areas and just let them go all over the ground and it had the most amazing effect of way less aphids. Like I said, I live in the woods, so they're everywhere. <laughs> but, but Deborah, it helps. but yes. Deborah. Yes. Mint takes on a life of its own. I agree. I put, it goes yes. everywhere and, you, and then you can't get rid of it. You, you, well, you can't make that's enough true. peppermint what, tea. To... I, well, that's true. What I did is I put them in pots and planted them in the ground. Yeah, there we go. Mm. Plant them in pots. Yeah. I, I put them in pots. I have tons of pots because of my business. and um just planted them you know in the pots everywhere and they awesome. they won't take over in your garden good thank you deborah yeah you're that. welcome um before i go i wanted to tell you about um your business and a passion i kind of stumbled on my life about orchids that way too i believe if you have a passion of anything and you go for it and you keep asking questions and research yeah. you're able to do something that's beautiful in your life to work along with it you know whether it's butterflies orchids or whatever it may be so it's wonderful that you're able to do that in your life yeah. you too deborah thank you it was nice talking to you all and i hope you all have a nice evening i have a question i wanted to i wanted to say something to cas about the, the aphids. At the end of the year, my um, milkweeds are turning yellow and I'm at risk of not having enough for them, the cats to eat. So I sprayed them with Windex and that didn't hurt the plant, but it got rid of all of the aphids. And then that book, the second book, I think it was, Carol, that you showed, it has all the bugs on the front of it. That is the best book to tell you what's a predator of which bugs. Yes, that is an outstanding book. I love that book. It tells you who are the enemies of the aphids. So that should help you a lot in your, your garden. What I did last year is I bought a ladybug and um, then I made large nets and I put the ladybugs in the nets and put the nets over the uh, the milkweed plant, oh. and that you know would work on it, but still, um, it it kind of confined the milkweed plant, and then the butterflies weren't able to get to it. So I would wait until they had caterpillars and put on it. And anyway, that's what I've been using with the the ladybugs. But I was just wondering if you had better ideas. I go out in my garden and I, I just take a bucket of water <laughs> and a, a little wipey thing, you know, whatever I've got in the house, and I wipe off my, my milkweed plants about every other day to keep those aphids off. And what Tony said about planting milkweed in different areas in your yard, some areas in my yard attract the aphids more than others. Um, so some of the plants they'll leave alone and I have a very small garden, but I have a lot of milkweed plants, but it's the only way that I just get out there and, and wipe them off and it works really well. Okay, thank you. Tony, I have a question. Hi, Marilyn. Yeah. Hi, um, so I live in Southern California. Southern California. 
Okay. I, okay, I live in Southern California. In 2019, we had no monarchs. Last year, we had a really good year. And so I'm surprised that the migration was so small. Do you know if there's any recommendations on how to um, you know, address this in Southern California? Are there things that people should be doing? Um, yeah, is there an organization that we should talk to? Um, so yeah, I'm definitely, I definitely am not up on what's going on out West because I live in Minnesota as, as much, but my understanding is a lot more people have been reporting monarch activity during this time when they're supposed to be, you know, in their migratory areas and they're not, they haven't been there, like at least during the Thanksgiving count. I, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, you've had like the California wired wildfires, you've had um, warmer temperatures than normal. Um, I, th I think one big problem that kind of gets overlooked that I don't hear people talking about so much is biological pest control. Um, because so many, there's, there's so many instances of um, parasitic, uh, parasitic wasps and flies like killing all the mo existing monarchs that are outside. And I'm just wondering how much of an effect that has because California is the, is the area where I hear a lot of those complaints from. So I feel like that might kind of be a missing component too of why the populations are so small sometimes. I think what they're saying in that is the farms because there's so much farming in Central yeah. California. And they're putting the pesticide on their plants which then somehow kills the monarchs. But we had a good year. So I was so surprised by what you're saying is maybe they're late in migrating. That, that could be it too. I mean, if your temperatures are warmer than normal, that's you know one of the things that is giving them the signal to migrate and they're not doing it. But I, there's something going on in California and um, I don't know what it is. Um, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with the, uh, the, the Xerxes Society. I don't know if you've ever. Yes, I'm familiar. Um, there's some other people in here um, in, on the West Coast that probably maybe have some more insight into this. Mm -hmm. um, Carol is also in, in the East, so. Well, the I think it's, uh, scary thing is, um, if they're down ninety percent, how do they make a comeback? You know, it's down so much. I guess I we'll have to. I don't think it's ever going to be back to where it was before. It's just kind of like, how are we going to adapt to the new normal? I mean, planting habitat is good, but as the the population explodes, um, I mean. The f there's no way that we're going to be able to replace all the habitat. I think gar 